You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast. I am your host and resident fanalist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore data. So I'm just going to get out there and say I didn't watch the game last night. You can pretty much assume unless it's a Packer game, I'm not watching any late anything. Thursday, Sunday, Monday, nothing. I just, it's not going to be a thing. Which is very sad, because I really, really would like to. But, you know, podcast alarm goes off at 3. It doesn't really work out all that well. It's just, it's not worth it. It's just not worth it. Unfortunately, next week is going to be painful. However, trying to piece together some of the pieces from yesterday before I actually watched the Saints game. And I did watch uh, a couple drives, and I do have a couple thoughts. Yeah, we're just getting after it today. Um, my experience with the Saints and whatnot started off outside of a couple updates from uh, my fantasy football app with a uh, text message saying, we're done, we're doomed, Packers are 2-1 and one after next week. And I'm thinking, oh man, Saints are just doing Saints stuff. It's 2019 Saints all over again. And so I flipped the game on real quick. It's 10 nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not trying to pick on you, man, but you're kind of asking for it when you send me those kind of tweets or text messages or whatever it was when it's 10 to nothing. Come on now. I know you are king of the pessimists, but come on now. But I still figure, all right, well, 10 nothing, but it's clearly going to be 21 nothing very shortly. And I turned it on right as the Raiders marched down and scored their first touchdown. Now, a few thoughts. This reminded me very much of the Packers-Vikings game. The Raiders wanted to run. The Saints sold out on the run. Every single play, it looked like they were just crashing down on the line of scrimmage. They were fast, they were violent, they brought eight, at least eight guys in the box. They were not going to let Josh Jacobs run. And so Gruden would set up a heavy run formation, and he started throwing to the tight ends. He started throwing to the running backs. He started, I don't know if I ever saw him once throw to a wide receiver, but I'm sure he did that too. And so he would do that a couple plays, and it would be very successful, and he'd say, okay guys, you're going to back off a little bit? Because remember, we're passing with ease here. This is very easy for us to throw, maybe back off. And they didn't. They try to run, and it would be like negative one yards. And it's like, all right, you flipping dummies, here we go again. And he'd pass, he'd pass, and he'd pass, and the Saints just would not stop. They would not stop. I mean, they're, they're petrified of Josh Jacobs, and rightly so. So without having watched the whole thing, I'm looking at a team that is has an extremely talented running back, a very good offensive line, and a team that decided we're terrified of this running back and we're going to do everything we can to stop him. The only difference here is, if that's the same strategy they employ against the Packers, instead of Derek Carr and a bunch of wide receivers he doesn't trust, and of course Darren Waller, which by the way, when this is done, I'm going to brag about my fantasy football team because I went 0-3 last week and 3-0 and this week, and I've this might be some of the best fantasy football lineups I've ever had in my life. Just annihilating everybody. But um, still, it, it, it's a very simple matter of, like I said, pick your poison. They picked their poison against the Raiders and lost. The Raiders aren't a good team. And uh, so, you know, it's, it, the, the funny series of events is I get the, the text messages, we're doomed. I watch one touchdown, go to, go to bed saying, yeah, but the Saints are still going to win. And then I wake up to about 18 tweets saying, man, the Saints are trash. The Saints look like garbage. This is, it's like, wait a minute, what happened in this game? Josh Jacobs looks so good, and I'm like, I don't know. I saw one series. He couldn't go anywhere. So obviously the Saints did back off, and that's when they started gashing him with the run, right? I heard Drew Bees looks like garbage, which is the same thing I heard last week. But again, it's just kind of funny because it started off very differently, apparently. I don't know. I watched uh, I watched the, the uh, Raiders touchdown, and then I saw the Saints turn around and score a touchdown, and that's when I was watching with my son, and I'm like, all right, man. We gotta we gotta cut it here and go to bed. So obviously we'll look more into that as the time comes. But it's all relatively promising news. Drew Brees looks like he's finally hit a little bit of a wall. If the reports are true, I haven't personally observed it. I've heard that about Tom Brady as well. I, I again I'm I'm just hearing the whispers. I did see one baldy breakdown thing where there was one deep pass and the guy was wide open and he had to like stop, turn around, and run back to catch the ball because it was so ridiculously underthrown. 
Um, but if that's also happening with Breeze, then it's just one of those things where, I mean, it's it's almost sad for the Saints. I don't care as a Packer fan. It's like, oh, good, it's one less team to worry about. But it is a little sad. It's like, man, they they were, and I'm not counting them out entirely, but man, they're so close, right on the cusp, best team in the NFC for like a couple years running now, or at least top two. I mean, just dominant. Off, they finally got a good defense, same as the Packers, right? They've had a dominant offense for a long time. But the defense has been one of the worst in football, so they just can't figure it out. Finally get a good offense and defense. We're primed to win the Super Bowl last year, and the Vikings just messed it up two years in a row. Just, again, the Vikings' only job, their only reason to exist is to make sure the Saints don't win the Super Bowl, apparently. And then gets just blown out because they're not good. But to then turn around, it's like, all right, now we're adding Emmanuel Sanders to this. So we've got the two wide receivers. Kamara's still looking good. Offensive line is still solid. Defensive line is good. Corners are good. Safeties are good. It's like, man, this is just, this is one of the best rosters in football. Yeah. <laughs> Except wide receiver one is hurt and your quarterback is just, he just hit a wall. He's just done. So, I, again, I didn't see it. I don't know. But that was my that was my observation from this is they looked a lot like the Vikings. They were they were just focused on stopping the run and Derek Carr and his tight end and you know Jason Witten I saw converting a first down. And when you're when you're selling out so hard hard that Derek Carr and Jason Witten are moving the sticks. I don't know, man. I don't know. But anyways, again, thanks for joining me. Um Tuesdays and again, this is kind of a so it's a fluid thing, and I think I kind of want it to be fluid. I, I mentioned how last year it was very rigid. There was a, a schedule. Mondays we do this, Tuesdays we do this, Wednesdays we do this, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and it got kind of boring, I, probably for you, but also especially for me. And it, there's no reason why the off season should be better than the regular season in terms of like you know keeping it fresh and funky. So there is going to be obviously a little bit of PFF stuff. I'm not going to sit here and just read off everything. I know some of you want that, but that's just it, it's not good. Um, and then look at some other stuff, snap counts, et cetera, et cetera. It's a little bit more nitty gritty now that we have some more concrete stuff. Unfortunately, as soon as I got started, I got the text message, Hey, I need help with the baby. So that kind of derailed things a bit, running a little behind, you know, the drill, but for that reason, um, we're going to get the preliminaries and the break out of the way so that we can just steamroll this thing as we move forward. First of all, let me just say publicly here on the podcast, welcome to all the new members of the, uh, Facebook group. I don't know who it was last night that invited their whole family, but I wake up this morning and there's like 15 people waiting to get in. I'm like, oh, howdy. So welcome. We did officially cross the 1000 uh, member mark in the Facebook group. It's a good old time. If you're not in there, get in there. And if you haven't liked the Packernet Podcast Facebook page, please do that. Because again, every once in a while, I feel like being spiteful and just putting things in the page because I feel like I've already told you that and you should have done it by now. Big shout out to Matt Sarver. Um, Oh, now it's letting me. I was going to say I wanted to thank you on Venmo, but it wouldn't let me do that. But now I see there's a comment thing, so now I just feel dumb and rude. But thank you very much for the uh, Venmo support. And then a big giant thank you. I think I said said this yesterday on the podcast. Thank you to Justin Cummings, I believe. But if I didn't, thank you very much. And then also newest patron, Daniel Telby. I'm, I'm really glad that I, I, I thought about not doing the yearly sign-up thing. I'm like, I just, I'm not interested in that. But everybody is doing that. So obviously that is what everybody's preference is. So there you go. I'm so happy to have you on board. Again, um, if you want to help support the podcast, patreon.com forward slash pack underscore daddy. I know there are several people who just don't like Patreon, whether it's because of the company and things they've done or just some other reason. I don't know what it is. Somebody mentioned they don't like the website. It's very clunky, which I would agree with. I want to be more interactive on there, but it's like, I just, it's hard. It's complicated to navigate everything. And I can't do anything on the app. The app is useless, but they're getting better. They're working on it. If you don't like Patreon, there's other options. Um, but thank you all very much for your support. I'll be sure to update my, uh, my graphic that says how many more people we need so that I don't have to go to work on Monday. I think we're at like 3,850, something like that. I updated it officially and added all the people that are already supporting me on Patreon because I figured that was fair. So, yeah, we're, we're getting there. I figure at this pace, about 10 years or so, <laughs> not including people that cancel subscriptions, we'll get there. But I really would appreciate if you'd at least consider that. You can join for as little as a buck a month. I think it's about 10 bucks to just pay up for the whole year. So just consider it. I'm just throwing it out there. It really is a big help. And, again, I'd like to be able to one day stay up for the Sunday night games. 
Um, the only reason I'm getting up at three in the morning is because I have to be to work at six in the morning. So, you know, that's how that, that's how that goes. Anyways, let's take a break right here. And again, we'll just uh, rapid fire, get as much in as we possibly can after the break. So let me start off by saying congratulations to Gary Opelt and Daniel, oh my goodness, McLenathan. I think I got that. Both Gary and Daniel um, are my first ever winners of the Iron Jock Player of the Game giveaway. I had two to give away this week. Two people picked Corey Lindsley to be the Iron Jock Player of the Game, and he was. And so these two fine gentlemen made my job very easy to figure out how to give two away this week. And uh, as soon as I get the shipment in, I'll be sending those out. This is this is really high quality stuff. Again, these are these are, I believe they're about seventy dollars. So it's not like just Walmart brand nothing. Actually, just recently, as in yesterday, um, after going through my third pair of shoes, because I go on like four mile walks every day, and I'm not the smallest human being on earth, I just rip up some thirty forty dollar shoes. I spent two hundred dollars on shoes. Because at the end of the day, I'm, I'm literally hurting myself by buying garbage instead of getting quality. And if you're tired of getting the same old rags and really genuinely want to start buying some quality, I'm not talking about replacing your whole wardrobe. I'm talking about treating yourself to some high quality materials, some high quality products. I would really encourage you to check out ironjock.com. It is a Wisconsin-based company. This is high quality, high technology material. They make polo shirts, vests, Long, short-sleeve workout shirts, sweatshirts, shorts, socks and underwear, running jackets, hoodies, pants. And every single item, not just a couple shirts, every single item is infused with nano silver. They actually have a proprietary silver ion technology process that provides permanent odor protection. Some of these companies, they have like the spray-on stuff that washes off after a while. This is actually infused. And when you wash it, it actually like reignites this stuff. It's really weird. Techn- he tried to explain it to me, but I'm a dummy. This stuff will kill 99.9% of all bacteria and fungus caused by sweating. It wicks away water. It's breathable. It's anti-static. Again, high-quality stuff. If you're interested, you can check this all out at ironjock.com. That's ironjock, spelled I-R-O-N-J-O-C.com. If you want a closer look at all this technology, they've got it all laid out for you. You can follow them on Facebook or follow them on Twitter, at ironjock. While we're at it, let me take a minute to tell you about my bookie, The absolute best in sports betting and live sports betting. If you're interested in spicing up your sports watching experience with a little bit of live betting as the action's going on, make sure you check out MyBookie. And if you're going to do that, do not forget when you sign up to use promo code OVERTIME. When you do that, MyBookie is going to double your deposit. You put down 20, they're going to give you an additional 20. To further incentivize this, which again is the reason why I'm saying there's no reason for you not to do so, because whatever the minimum is, it's an option. Let me just put that out there. When you sign up at mybookie.ag and when you use promo code OVERTIME, what we want you to do is take a snippet, a snapshot, a picture, something, and you're going to take that information, you're going to send it to overtime at advertisecast.com. You're sending an email. And when you send that over, you are entered into a drawing to win $500 cash. Overtime is my parent network. And obviously, we are very interested in doing business with my bookie, so we're, we're incentivizing the heck out of this because it means that much to us. So please check out Overtime, check out my bookie, use promo code Overtime, send over that email. You don't have that much time because the drawing is at the end of September. In about a week, we're going to be giving away $500 cash to somebody that listens to this show. Don't miss out. I want to tell you guys real quick about our new sponsor, Factor. Factor makes delicious, ready-to-eat meals, and they get sent right to your door. They have 35 different options every single week that you can choose from, including keto, calorie smart, vegan and veggie, and more. And there's even more to enjoy with over 55 nutrition-packed add-ons that help make your weekly meal planning even more delicious. There's no prep work. There's no messing up six different bowls, mixing stuff. Factor meals are 100% ready to heat and eat. No prep, no cook, no cleanup. Factor is also very flexible with your schedule. You can get as much or as little as you need by choosing between 6 to 18 meals per week. You can also pause or reschedule your deliveries anytime. Factor is less expensive than takeout, and every meal is dietitian approved. So head to factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 and use code packdaddy50 to get 50% off. That's code packdaddy50 at factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 to get 50% off.
Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard in your entire life of test driving a phone network? Well, now you have, because U.S. Cellular is going to let you test drive their network for free for 30 days. So anywhere you go where you got some dead spots, where your service isn't super strong, you're trying to listen to the podcast and it drops out when you go here because you got no internet service anymore, real simple. Just whip out your phone, do a little beep boop bop boop, that's you pushing the buttons to go to the right place, and you can get the app and try it out for yourself. So go ahead and test drive U.S. Cellular's award-winning network free for 30 days. That's U.S. Cellular, built for us. Terms apply, awards based on open signal, independent data. So go to uscellular.com for all the details. Well, since that um, baby needs help tweet I've or text I've since gotten, can you please help the boy out because he's actively getting sick? Followed by, can you please come up and give him some medicine? So, at this rate, we uh, we got to be a little economical with our time. But I want to start here. I want to look at, um, as we continue to monitor the trends, and I said snap counts. We're not doing snap counts today. That'll be a separate episode, maybe tomorrow. But when we look at personnel, keep in mind, this is a team that was one of the more 11 personnel heavy in the NFL. It's one of the more, I mean, 11 personnel most people run more than anybody else or anything else. Um, If we go back to 2018, just to illustrate what I'm talking about, the Green Bay Packers ran 11 personnel um, more than anybody except the L.A. Rams, which for some reason their thing is all blocked out, so I don't really know what their percentage is. But 77% in third is 75%. So the Packers ran 11 personnel pretty much just all the time. And they passed 72% of the time out of 11 personnel. Because the Packers are a team that just pass, 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 pass. We go three wide, pass, 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 pass. One running back, one tight end, three wide receivers, pass, 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 pass. And we wonder why Mike McCarthy was kind of seen as a guy that uh, was not all that creative. Which, interestingly enough, is uh, when I listen to recaps of Dallas, as much as everybody's excited they won that game, they came back and all that, the note or the takeaway that I heard is that they really need to be less predictable. You know, running on first down, and as soon as I heard that, I started busting out laughing. I was like, oh man, Mike, it is the same old Mike. You mean he's predictable and he runs on first down like every time and you know what he's going to do, so they run for like three yards because it's just, it's basically a wasted down, like we just want second and seven. All right, fair enough. So anyways, again, 2018, Green Bay Packers, 77% out of 11 personnel. 2019, our first year under Matt LaFleur, as we kind of head in the opposite direction, we were basically exactly average. 60% of the league runs 11, or the league runs 11 60% of the time. We did it 60% of the time. Uh, The league runs 12% uh, personnel. Man, I'm stumbling and bumbling here. 12 personnel, 20% of the time, we ran it 20% of the time. So it's pretty just across the board, right? As I've mentioned several times now. We went from 60% so far down to 35% out of 11 personnel. 35%. There were almost no teams last year that were less than 50%. There was like the 49ers and the Vikings and maybe like two others. 35%. So far in 2020, uh, Philadelphia and San Francisco are the only two teams that run 11 personnel less. 12 personnel. The league is running at 19%, which is about average. That's basically what it was last year. It was at 20 The Packers are currently at 26%. 12 personnel. I'm so tired of this. I can't stop the alarms, but they drive me nuts. As a reminder, is one running back, two tight ends. The Packers currently run this 12th most in the NFL. They're only passing 31% of the time out of 12 personnel. They're running 69% of the time. Then we get to 21 personnel. It's the third most common grouping but it's far less than obviously the, especially 11 personnel and uh, about half as often as 12 personnel. So 21, again, two running backs, one tight end, two wide receivers. The average in the NFL is 8%, basically the exact same as last year. The NFL is extremely predictable in this way. The Packers are currently running this 26% of the time. The only team that runs it more is the 49ers running it 41% of the time. The Packers pass out of this 51% compared to 49% running out of this formation. There are other packages to run three wide receivers out of, for example, 20 personnel, but the Packers don't do that. The only time the Packers have three wide receivers on the field currently is 11 personnel, and they're only running that 35% of the time. 
52% of the time they're running out of either 12 or 21 personnel, which is two wide receivers. They also run uh, 6% of the time out of 13 personnel, which is one running back, three tight ends, one wide receiver, 6% of the time. The average is three. The next uh, most common grouping is two running backs, two tight ends, one wide receiver. We run that 4% of the time. Uh, the only other things we've seen, one time we ran with five wide receivers. Once we ran with three running backs, two tight ends, which must have been like Aaron Jones, Jamal, and DeGuara, who lined up as a fullback. He's kind of in that H-back spot, but they counted it that way. I don't know. We've done that twice. So that would be fun to watch if we can go back and find that. And then 31, which would be three running backs and a tight end. Same situation, one less tight end. Um, the interesting thing about 32 personnel is that there's no wide receivers in that formation. It's probably a goal line formation is what it is. But with all this, you would kind of expect, it sounds like, this is much more of a big boy, run-heavy offense, right? But it doesn't feel that way. Aaron Rodgers is still carving people up. Well, the problem with only two weeks is that you can't get a full picture because a lot of this is based on game plan and how things are going. Obviously, week one, we passed a, a lot more than we would probably normally expect because of how the Vikings are situated. In week two, we ran more, despite the fact that both weeks we actually ran less or ran more than the NFL average. But currently, and we still have to wait on New Orleans and the Raiders and see how that comes back, but right now the Packers are the ninth most run-heavy team in football. They pass the ball 53% of the time compared to the NFL average of 57%. Last year, the Packers were uh, at 60% passing. So it's gone already, even with week one being somewhat pass heavy, from 60% down to 53%. So JJ, don't start counting your eggs yet, but there is a very strong contingent of people on Twitter who are standing on the fact that the Packers are not going to change. They're still going to be a pass first offense, which of course, almost everybody is pass first. Run heavy would be anything under about 60%, or I guess 57% in this case. And they swear up and down that the Packers are not going to be running more, uh, which is something that I have disagreed with. So far, the Packers clearly are more dedicated to the run. Not than the pass, but clearly more dedicated to the run than they were last year, and clearly more dedicated to the run than the NFL average. And again, it's not just because we ran a lot last week. We ran more than the NFL average in week one. So, I mean, look, there's no question, and Matt LaFleur even said this, he is still slowly unraveling this NFL offense of his. And I think that's going to be stagnated, again, by the fact that Aaron Rodgers is the most lethal piece on this offense. So as much as you want to be a run-heavy team, that stinks. Also, your dynamic running back is a guy that you don't want to carry 20, 25 times in a game like you would a Derrick Henry or an A.J. Dillon. So as much as maybe your ideal offense you know, in your dream world is sort of a Jordan Love, A.J. Dillon, Josiah DeGuara offense. We've got still this Mike McCarthy kind of offense that's really humming right now. Not not in terms of his, his play calling, but his guys, right? The, the players that fit his system are gelling really well with this Matt LaFleur system, and we're not about to get away from it. Like I said yesterday, A.J. Dillon, he's doing fantastic right now. I think he's the highest graded running back we have on the team, and I think it was uh, Ross Uglum, I believe, yesterday on Twitter, who kind of broke down because a lot of people are obviously upset. How in the world is A.J. A. A. Dillon graded higher than Aaron Jones? That's ridiculous. Well, he broke that all down. Of course, limited sample size, but the fact of the matter is, again, Aaron Jones last week, or this past game, 20% of the time against a stack box. Otherwise, you know, the offensive line is blowing holes open for the guy. Not that he isn't doing a great job. He graded out fine. A.J. Dillon saw 8, 9, and even 10 guys in the box on his handful of carries. And uh, on every play, it was, let me just find it so I can say it properly. Not that I have time for this, but let's do it anyways. Here we go. He says, and finally, the story of A.J. Dillon getting an elite grade from PFF on just seven offensive snaps. First play, players in the box, nine. First contact, minus two yards. He gains three, which is plus five after contact. And these are, by the way, 100% Aaron Jones goes down on these plays. Not saying A.J. Dillon is better than Aaron Jones. I'm just telling you. On this play right here, which was basically his cartwheel play, this, I believe, linebacker came in and just cut him real hard, just blew out his legs. Next play, players in the box, 9.5. He says you can call it 10. His first contact was three yards down the field. He gains 13, an additional 10 after contact, and he broke about eight tackles on that play. And I actually missed the first one here. Its first contact is four yards behind the line of scrimmage. So the offensive line is doing nothing. And that's not their fault. They're just completely overwhelmed. 
Remember, remember, this is when Boyle comes in. And this is why I told you, had A.J. Dillon come in one series earlier, he would have got his 10 carries, he would have got his 61 yards, I'm telling you that. Eight players in the box. First contact is four yards behind the line of scrimmage. He has a three-yard gain. That's a seven yards after contact run. So on average, we've got he's hit four yards behind the line of scrimmage, two yards behind the line of scrimmage, and three yards. So it's minus three yards total is what the expected yards would have been. He gained 19 yards on three carries. That's why the guy got an elite grade. That's why everybody getting upset about A.J. Dillon needs to shush. There's a lot of context here. When all you're doing is grinding out the clock, the defense doesn't care even a little bit about the wide receivers. They're selling out against the run. They know you're going to run. Nobody runs well against this. A.J. Dillon went above and beyond on this. How did we even get here? Oh, because ideally A.J. Dillon is is the guy, but we're not turning over to A.J. Dillon right now because we currently have a running back that doesn't exactly fit, but it doesn't matter because he's just fantastic. Now, the concern, however, is we are pushing Aaron Jones to the limit. He had 16 carries against the Vikings, 18 carries against the Lions. Remember, Mike McCarthy was running him like 12, 13 times a game, largely because he's like, I don't want to burn this guy out, and Matt LaFleur agrees. He agrees, I don't, we don't want to burn this guy out. We want him to not only be fresh for this game in the fourth quarter, we want him to be fresh next week, we want him to be fresh for the playoffs. We don't want to burn this guy out. Right now, we're in burn this guy out territory. So I fully expect this to get dialed back. But again, the problem is we're, we're in very important games, and Aaron Jones is just, he's just so electric. He's too good. Now, I, I definitely think Matt LaFleur could have backed off earlier. If you don't want to put in A.J. Dillon, which I think you should have, that's fine. Put in Jamal. Jamal was running beautifully. But, man, Matt LaFleur, he, he sends his blood in the water. He can't stop. He just wanted to bludgeon the Detroit. I don't know what Matt Patricia did to Matt LaFleur, but he just wanted to bludgeon that man. I don't know why he felt the need to do that, but that was kind of cruel a little bit. But anyways, that's, that's where we're at, and I don't see it reversing course. Again, there's going to be games where we pass more and there's going to be games where we run more, but I think on average, this is the trend. We're going to see more two running back, more two and three wide uh, tight end, and for the most part, two wide receiver. There's, there's, I don't want to say not that much, but even, even being less than 50% on uh, 11 personnel is, is rare. Again, the average is about 60%. We're running at 35%. That's, that's ridiculously low. And that's on average. That wasn't just last week. That's on average. I think we were at 25% against the Lions, which again, which which is also shocking because they're completely depleted at corner. So you would think if it's just based on how do you best attack their weaknesses, you spread out your wide receivers and attack their weakness at corner. But Matt LaFleur didn't want to do that. We're the stronger team. Why worry about their weaknesses? Let's play to our strengths and trust that they can't stop us. That's what they did, and it worked. So anyways, there's that observation. Switching over to PFF, um, currently the Green Bay Packers are still the number one overall team. I certainly don't see the Saints overtaking that. In fact, they were 19th to begin with, so it's not like there's that far to go. Raiders are 21st, so that ain't going to change. Currently 82.8 overall, despite having uh, defense in the 50s. The next highest graded uh, overall team is the LA Rams right now with a 79.5, so it's a decent sized lead. Um, Passing is really where it comes into play. Yes, Aaron Rodgers is still graded out as the number one quarterback, slightly above Russell Wilson. It's one of those things where if people want to get upset, I really don't care. It's it's not a meaningful argument. Who's better between Aaron Rodgers and Russell Wilson? If you think it's Russell Wilson, that's fine. I'm not going to fight you over that. I don't even know if PFF would fight you over that. They would obviously disagree because they have a pretty strenuous process that they're very proud of in terms of how to judge good and bad throws and play and everything else. Um, But I, I doubt it would be worth fighting over because they're both just playing out of their minds and Russell Wilson is just continuing to get better and better and he's a freak which is why he's also graded out as elite but uh 94.8 overall passing pass blocking it's not even close 90.3 compared to 85 New England Patriots receiving is actually graded quite low uh PFF is not all that impressed with our receivers run blocking is still uh second highest behind just the Cleveland Browns so the the offensive line is just absolutely fantastic as well as, by the way, the wide receivers and tight ends, who are also very good run blockers. Um, getting into the specifics of this game, as I mentioned, Corey Lindsley, the highest overall graded player, but there were three elite players on this offense. Corey Lindsley, Aaron Rodgers for the second week in a row, and A.J. Dillon. Now, you can count out A.J. Dillon if you want, because he only had seven carries. 
excuse me, seven snaps, five run carries, and two uh, blocking plays. The next highest was, in fact, Aaron Jones, so please don't burn everything down. He wasn't graded as elite, but he graded out just fine. I think the biggest knock against him was his pass blocking grade was horrible, so that dragged him down quite a bit. Um, But his receiving grade was fantastic. His run grade was fine. It was good. So his run grade was good. His pass or his receiving grade was very good, and his pass blocking grade was terrible. We'll get into uh, the pass blocking stats in a moment. Other guys that graded out well, David Bakhtiari and Mercedes Lewis. After that, however, it was kind of just okay. Everybody pretty much graded out average. The guys that did not do very well, Marquez Valdez, Scantling was below average, Malik Taylor, Tyler Irvin, Alan Lazard, and John Lovett were below average. Jay Sternberger obviously was uh, terrible. He graded out in the 20s. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. Looking at pressures, only five pressures given up. Two of them were by Rick Wagner, one by Aaron Jones, one by Lucas Patrick, and one by David Bakhtiari. As far as grades, Elton Jenkins was the highest graded pass blocker, followed by Lucas Patrick, Mercedes Lewis, Jamal Williams, and then John Runyon, who I honestly didn't even know was on the field. He was out for uh, eight snaps. Uh, Then you got Corey Lindsley, David Bakhtiari, Robert Tanyan, and then Rick Wagner, and then Aaron Jones obviously was the one that was bad. It was kind of funny because I was talking to a friend of mine, and um, he was like, "I'm, I'm curious to know, like, Corey Lindsley graded out as elite. How does that break down in terms of pass run? And then we realized how well Aaron Jones did and the fact that he didn't grade out all that well. And it's like, I think that kind of answers the question. So Corey Lindsley had a 91.2 overall run blocking grade. This is a very rare situation for an offensive lineman for the Green Bay Packers to grade out this well run blocking. I mean, for any offensive lineman, as I've said before, if you go back and look at offensive linemen throughout the league, very few really solid run blockers because the, the NFL obviously mostly cares about pass blocking. But you got Matt LaFleur, he comes in and he just, he really preaches it and he really coaches. And we probably have a lot of talent, guys like Corey Lindsley, who again, he got on the, t- when he came to Green Bay, his his claim to fame was that he benches like 500 pounds. He's just a big mauling monster. So it kind of makes sense that once he gets coached up and taught and they really emphasize it, that he's the guy that really b- breaks out um, as a dynamic run blocker. Um, after that, the highest graded, surprisingly. And he had nine snaps doing this. It was the only thing he did, apparently, as far as blocking is concerned. Maybe just anything. I don't think he did anything other than run blocking. Is Tyler Irvin. He was basically a giant decoy in this game. But uh, as he's kind of running these fake jet sweeps, he goes out and run blocks. And apparently he's just tearing it up because he's in Matt LaFleur's offense and he wants to impress his coach. And if you want to do that, you go light somebody up on a run play. Uh, The only other guy, which two weeks in a row now, something I did not expect, David Bakhtiari. Everybody else was uh, average, with the exception of a couple that were below average, the worst of which was Mr. John Lovett, followed by, shockingly, Alan Lazard, and then MVS, and actually Elton Jenkins. As I've said, very good pass blocker. He does struggle to, to run block on occasion, and today apparently wasn't his best day. But whatever. Again, if you don't believe it, that's fine. Go back and watch it. Draw your own conclusion. Feel free to send me the results if you so choose. I I used to do that. I, I, I used to... Uh, do what Andy Herman does. I think I actually started before him, but you know, that's fine. Grading out every single Packers player. Um, but it's just, it's, it's way too time consuming. Um, I will make a commitment to you. If we get those 3,850 extra patrons, I will commit to doing that. Grading out the players myself, watching every game, every snap, every player, because it was, I mean, it's time consuming, but it was a lot of fun and you definitely learn a lot. And even though my process is probably garbage and you're better off trusting PFF anyways, cause I'm not a scout. Um, it was a good way to kind of at least be able to see it. And if there's differences, there di- there's differences, and that's just the way it is. But again, as of right now, why do I lean so heavily on PFF? It's the only scouting industry that is public information. Right? I can't talk to the Packers pro personnel staff and, and ask their opinion on a player. There is no other scouting entity that watches players. There's stats, there's advanced stats, and there's one company that scouts and actually grades out players the way scouts do, and then gives the results, and that's PFF. So that's that's why I lean heavily on them. Um, there's been a lot of talk about the Packers not attacking the middle of the field. Some very good uh, news to report here. Aaron Rodgers' number one area of the field is middle of the field between 10 and 20 yards. He was 4 of 5, 52 yards, one touchdown, no interceptions, 149.6 passer rating. There's also the deep right side of the field. Uh, which has just kind of been his bread and butter for a very long time. Two of three, 71 yards. The next best area of the field was um, 
short middle. So again, the middle of the field is really, really stepping up here. And this is heavily scheme dependent. Probably plays into why, you know, Lazard and those guys didn't grade out as well as you might think, because they don't really have to do much other than run on a straight line the way that they're told, and they're just open. But 7 of 8 for 88 yards, 112.5 passer rating. So the middle of the field, outside of deep right, was the most dynamic area for the Green Bay Packers. And that's not just different from last year, that's different from just last week. So again, just showing the flexibility. Last week, they're attacking the edges, didn't do much in the short middle at all. 3 of 5 for 26 yards, 73.8 passer rating. One pass on the intermediate middle, one pass intermediate deep, and they come back, play the Lions, and attack the middle of the field. Probably has something to do with the safeties and linebackers for Minnesota compared to uh, Detroit. But again, the point is they can do it. That's the point. Find the weakness and just attack it. You know, we're still playing our game. We run our personnel with the guys that we think are the best 11. But uh, whether I call guys to the middle or, or, or scheme guys open Deep is dependent on how the defense is playing and how much you guys are terrible. So it's, it's great to see that versatility and that flexibility and just, again, the fact that they can do it, something that most teams attack with ease that uh, the Packers could not. One of the biggest things that scared me last week was the fact that Aaron Rodgers was horrible when he was under pressure. He wasn't under pressure much, but it's scary because you figure other teams are going to be able to bring pressure, and if this is a problem, then it's obviously a problem. Uh, he graded out 86.7 overall when there was no pressure, 80.3 when under pressure. Again, not under pressure much, but the fact that he handled it so well. Um, he was pressured on six of his dropback. He threw the ball four times, completed only two, but for 63 yards, 15.8 yards per attempt. So again, the, the, the point is it helps to alleviate some of that fear. One of those was a sack, which on the pressure thing, it didn't even show a sack, which I don't know why. Uh, There was also one drop on that, but a 95.8 passer rating while under pressure. So he handled it just fine. Um, As far as the running backs, a little bit more uh, on this. The running grades in particular, A.J. Dillon, 81. uh, Aaron Jones, 70. Jamal, 67. Obviously, Dillon had 17 yards. uh, Aaron Jones had 168. Jamal had 63 yards per attempt. A.J. Dillon, 3.4. Aaron Jones, 9.3. Jamal, 7.9. Hilariously, as somewhat pointed out, A.J. Dillon had 3.5 yard, 4, 3.4 yards per attempt, 3.8 yards after contact per attempt. <laughs> he had more yards after contact than he had yards total. He also had the most avoided tackles of any running back. Aaron Jones had three avoided tackles. Jamal had one avoided tackle. A.J. Dillon had four avoided tackles on five attempts. <laughs> That's just ridiculous. Aaron Jones had three on 18. So, pretty wild. Obviously, nobody did a bad job. Really happy with this entire group. I'm not trying to dog anybody or make any kind of statement other than if you're upset about A.J. Dillon for some dumb reason, please stop. Um, The highest graded receiver, Aaron Jones, 81.6 receiving grade. After that was Mercedes Lewis, 69.8. And then I kind of mentioned it goes down from there. Devontae was only given a 64.2. I know a lot was made of his injury, but um, he kind of disappeared for a while. And, And I know Okuda graded out poorly. It was a little strange to see that he wasn't out there. Not worried about Devontae. It's just one of those things. Everybody has up games and down games. Aaron Rodgers is going to have a bad day one of these days. It's going to happen. It's just a matter of can we have Aaron Jones and these receivers and the defense step up when that happens. That's the biggest thing. And that was a big thing last year. The offense would do terribly and the defense would bail us out or vice versa. We got to get that going again because it's coming. The the offense is going to have a bad day. Um, Aaron Jones, and you probably heard this on the broadcast, but um, of his four receptions, two of them came against linebackers, Jared Davis and Jamie Collin. One of them came against safety, Will Harris, and then one came against slot corner, Daryl Roberts. So he beat two linebackers, a safety, and a corner. Marquez was 2 of 5 against Jeff Okuda for 56 yards. His other reception was against Jared Davis, the linebacker. So again, obviously, if you can create those kind of mismatches where you got guys like MVS streaming across the middle of the field being, being covered by Jared Davis, that's pretty ideal. Um, Lazard had one catch against Okuda for 25 yards. He was also two for two against Amani Aruarie, their cornerback, who is not very good, as I mentioned. Tanyan's two receptions came against safeties, so that's obviously pretty promising. Um, I mean, anytime you're catching passes, that's good, but it's, you know, if you're, if it's, if it's that you're schemed against garbage, that's one thing. Um, if you're catching passes against guys like Tracy Walker, who are pretty solid, or Deron Harmon, who's their free safety, that's, that's a little bit more impressive. Devontae exclusively was, exclusively was against Jeff Okuda, was 3-for-3 three three for 36 yards. Jace, it doesn't matter who he was up against. 
but I'll mention they were linebackers. But, I mean, he, he obviously beat the guy. He just dropped everything. Tyler Irvin. That was wrong. He did have a reception in this game. One target, one reception for four yards. That was also against Jeff Okuda. So we just we just brutalized that poor man. That poor guy. I didn't really realize who was catching what on what, but um, that is that is a heck of an introduction to the NFL going up against this red-hot Green Bay Packers offense because he just absolutely got brutalized. He's currently one of the worst-graded cornerbacks in all of football right now. So just, again, Matt LaFleur is just He's not just trying to beat the guys in this division. He's brutalizing people in this. He's demoralizing our division. I think that's the plan. By the time we come around next time, I want you to be so beaten, battered, bloodied, and embarrassed that you don't even want to take the field against the Packers. Why didn't he pull Aaron Jones a little earlier? Because we're just going to stomp on him one more time. I want him to remember this when we face him next time. Um, anyways, switching over to the defense, which was improved, we had Jair Alexander as the highest graded player on the team. He is currently the highest graded cornerback in all of football. I mentioned last week um, he graded out fairly well. He had a couple, you know, passes caught against him. One of which, as I said, was extremely tight coverage. He graded in the 70s. He was fine. But you couple that with this elite performance. I mean, literally. Uh, 80.8 tackling grade. He's doing a great job bringing guys down, but also a 90.2 cover grade. I can't remember the last time we had a Packer with an elite coverage grade. I mean, actually in the 90s. Uh, He had five tackles, one stop. He was targeted five times. Four of them were caught for only 19 yards. He added to that one pass breakup, 82.5 pass rating when targeted. Josh Jackson was the second highest defender. You don't have to necessarily count it because he was only out there for five snaps, but one target, zero receptions, one pass breakup. When you got one target and one pass breakup, 39.6 passer rating, I don't know how you get a 39.6 when you don't complete anything. I don't know. I guess incompletes register is something. But, uh, yeah, fantastic. Another guy, and I didn't put this on, on Twitter at all. Again, um, not a lot out there, but another guy that was relatively impressive. Is that right? That's not right. No, th- this site says he has a QB hit. Well, whatever. PFF is registering it as a sack. Mr. Vernon Scott. Third highest graded player on the team. Again, just like Josh Jackson, only five snap. Um, he rushed the passer. Actually, he didn't. He was in coverage five times, but similar to Kevin King, his one sack came on a play when he wasn't even coming after the quarterback. It must have been like a QB scramble, and uh, I think the official NFL designation was that it was a, a, a tackle or a hit. Uh, PFF's calling it a sack. But anyways, he, he looked good. Uh, next up, very important, Chandon Sullivan, who had a really rough week one. Bounces back is the fourth highest graded player, second highest graded actual starter, 80.9 overall grade, real good run defense grade, real good tackling grade, real good coverage grade. Just across the board, Chandon really stepped up in this game. Six targets, only two receptions for 49 yards. He had an interception and a pass breakup in this game. Obviously, he added a touchdown to that, 24.3 pass rating when targeted. And let's not forget, this is not a garbage group of wide receivers. I think their number, their, their best receiver arguably is in the slot, so real good game from Chandon. Uh, next guy with a solid grade was actually Will Redmond. Good to see. Didn't play a ton, but there you go. Kevin King graded out pretty well in this game. 73.8 overall. Graded out well across the board. Run defense, tackling, and coverage. Zero targets, zero receptions. You can't argue with that. Um, Chris Barnes, again, he only played 15 snaps, but again, grading out really well. One of the best graded players on our entire team right now, um, which means a lot because Christian Kirksey was the lowest graded player on our team. If we break it down by category... Run defense, the only real solid guy was Chandon, but uh, Kevin King, Amos, Preston, and Chris Barnes all graded out fairly well. Tackling, most of the team is doing fantastic. Usually you have a lot of people struggling. It's right now either you're really good or you're really terrible. Pretty much the whole team is doing a really fantastic job. Montrevious is the only guy kind of in the middle. But Raven Green, Kingsley Kiki, Darnell Savage, and Adrian Amos all graded out horribly. Um, Amos, it was pretty obvious what his issue was when he's throwing shoulders at giant tight ends. Pass rush, the only guy that graded out extremely well was Vernon Scott because it's one attempt, one sack or hit or whatever. Um, And this is another area where people are going to be upset because Rashawn Gary had a good game stat-wise, but he graded out pretty average as a pass rusher. And the way that I look at that is if we're talking about four pressures on 23 attempts, the question really comes down to what did you do on those other 19 attempts? And again, PFF not all that impressed. And my thought process on that is that I think Rashawn is still pretty raw. It's starting to come together. It's really starting to look good. The biggest issue, though, and his run defense was terrible, is that I think he's he's really raw, and his athleticism just kind of works out sometimes. When you're that strong and you're that fast, sometimes it's just going to work. And that's why I've been predicting he's going to be getting sacks, because he's so close. 
I mean, just based on his speed and his power, he's going to get there eventually. He's going to accidentally get a sack once in a while. So I, I still think he's got a ways to go, which is a great sign. Uh, he had four pressures and two sacks in this game. I got into arguments with people yesterday saying, no, it was 1.5. Again, I, I disagree with it. I know that's the official stat, but I think they just mark that wrong. They do that so that the sacks add up to what the total number of sacks were at the end of the game, but I'm not going to deduct a sack from Rashawn Gary because somebody else was there at the same time. And you can say, well, yeah, but he maybe wouldn't have got the sack if it wasn't for the other guy. Okay, but you can say that about a pressure. Why don't you give somebody a half sack if, if Zadarius scares the quarterback into you? I mean, should Chandon Sullivan get a half of a pick because Rashawn Gary uh, had a pressure, and so he had sort of an assist? No, we don't do that with anything else that's stupid. He got a sack, it's a sack. So he's currently leading the team um, with pressures. I believe they're tied in sacks with uh, Zadarius, and he has a 15.6 pressure rate, which is ridiculously high. He's doing a fantastic job. Coverage was solid in the game. Again, Jair was elite. Josh Jackson was great. Chandon was really solid. Kevin King was good. Uh, the guys that struggled, Christian Kirksey was really bad, Preston was really bad, Adrian Amos was really bad, Raven Green was pretty bad. But it was Raven Green's first game back, we got to give the guy a little bit of a break. I mean, his first game back for a long time, he wasn't playing last year either. Uh, in this game, there was actually one pick and four pass breakups, I mentioned some of them. Uh, Jackson, Jair, Chandon, and Will Redmond all had pass breakups. So the DBs really stepped up in this game, man. I mean, everybody, Josh Jackson, Jair, Chandon, uh, Redmond. Savage kind of had his second bad game. Amos kind of had his second bad game, but Kevin King was in there. It was a big day for them. And as the pass rush slowly starts to get better and the DBs really start to step up, we're inching. We're inching in that direction, and that's all I can really ask for. As frustrating as it might be, because I want Zadarius to be the same Zadarius, and I want Preston to be the same Preston, and that seems to be very... I mean, I, I, I said I was expecting regression. I didn't expect it to be this bad. I'm hoping he gets he steps it up a little bit. Anyways, any, only other real interesting things here, special teams, Ty Summers uh, was the only guy that stood out as a really solid guy. For what? I don't know. Montrevious was the only one that was terrible, so I'm getting used to saying that. Kicking, J.K. Scott was fantastic. He's currently, I think, rated as the third best punter in football. He had a great day. Mason obviously was fine. Two for two on field goals, four for four on extra points, so he's, he's off and running. So all is well. The offense is still humming. Defense is slowly improving. And if we're willing to be patient, which I am, this is this is shaping up to be a really solid team. I mean, if, if we can just, and I, I, maybe I'm just being greedy with this, but if we just see continued progress from Rashawn and, and Jair stays at this level, which people have been predicting for a while, guys that have really been watching him. I know some of the PFF guys last year said he might be one of the next greats. I'm not trying to count my chickens or anything, and, and we saw some really good stuff. I mean, this was about the same time last year when that article came out about he's going to be the next great, and then he just kind of fell off and went back to being good, not great kind of a corner. But, I mean, if he can stay at this level, that that does such amazing things. I mean, just think like old school Darrell Rivas, who I think was the guy that they kind of um, compared him to in terms of the last time we've seen a guy like this. Just think how impactful that is. Even if you don't have the greatest DBs everywhere else on the field, to be able to put a guy like Jair or let's say Revis, and I'm, I, I understand it sounds ridiculous, but I'm just saying, off to a solid start. You put a guy like that on another team's number one and take him away, that level of impact is unbelievable. That's why most of the the film nerds and the stat nerds and everything else right now are saying that, that corners are more important than pass rushers. Stopping the pass through with your DBs is more important than, than pass rush. I'm sure they got some great wonderful algorithm that figured that all out but anyways i really got to get going i went way over but uh wanted to be able to put together some kind of an episode here with all the madness going on at my house again thank you all very much for those of you that support thank you for everybody that is in the group and on the page and is just along for this fun little ride of ours it's off to a great start this season excited next week we get our first real real test no offense well i I do mean to offend uh plenty of offense to the vikings and lions fans but uh, just, you know, regression or not for the Saints, this is this is a legit football team. This is top to bottom. They've got some real good pieces. And we're obviously going to be looking at all that. But anyways, you folks have yourselves a fantastic day. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Have a good one. Bye-bye.